Okay, so um, in our fourth session, then, um, our title is Estrangement and Aesthesis. So estrangement, we've talked about before, I've told you about um, another word which is somehow synonymous with defamiliarization or making strange. You can see the strange in estrangement or also estrangement, which is how it is somehow uh, translated from the Russian sometimes. So aesthesis though is a new element here. So you can see it's related to aesthetic or aesthetics, uh, which you may be more familiar with as a concept. Aesthesis is not that common a word, but it means, as you can see, um, the perception of the external world by the senses. So it's about sensory perception. So that's what we're going to look at. How is this concept of making strange related to the senses? And we will answer this in various ways over the next few weeks. So firstly, um, looking at the etymology, and this is one tool, one digital tool, which I've probably mentioned before, this etym online. Um, site which tells you the etymology of words it's extremely helpful for understanding where a concept comes from and how it develops over time um, this au you can see which is from proto-indo-european uh, language which is kind of pre-ancient greek ancient roman it but feeds into that um, this au which forms part of so many words we have now to do with perception, um, it means to perceive. So you can see all these different words, which you will mainly be familiar with, about audio, so about listening or aesthete, aesthetic, auditory, um, and some of these uh, ones which we'll come to later in later sessions synesthesia, polyesthesia, paresthesia, hyperesthesia, um, all of these different terms to do with perceiving in different ways. So that's what we're focusing on, perception. So thinking a bit more about perception, how can we think about perception? Um, it's been answered in various ways. If we go back to the middle of the 20th century, we have this uh, movement, this philosophical movement uh, or domain of phenomenology, Merleau-Ponty being um, one of the main proponents of this. Uh, in his book, Phenomenology of Perception, he gives you this scenario where he says, if I can, with my left hand, feel my right hand as it touches an object. So that's me, my uh, left hand touching my right hand, which is touching an object. The right hand as an object is not the right hand as it touches. The first is a system of bones, muscles and flesh brought down at a point of space. The second shoots through space like a rocket to reveal the external object in its place. So he is giving us lots of different complexities to the action of touching. And this is one of the senses. Um, we touch with our skin and we can also call it haptic perception. So he also does some other, even more brain kind of mangling things where he talks about touching yourself like this so your hand touches itself and what does that mean um so this is one way we can think about uh an organ of perception being the skin the skin as an organ of perception um i also put this image here and this is a a, a sea organ or a high tide organ so this is a different kind of 
organ. And we, we know that an organ is something that can be played in a church. It's a musical instrument. Um, and I put the etymology of organ also there for you. So this is organon from the Greek, meaning tool, instrument, or sense organ. So all of these interpretations of the word organ are relevant. Um, and in this particular example, we have a structure which is on, uh, on a walkway near the sea, and when and it's fill, and it has um, air inside the structure. And when the sea comes in, when the tide comes in, um, it forces air up through this uh, long tendril-like structure and plays a note, plays a musical note. So this gives us a whole load of different ideas about uh, perception and about organs, because it makes us think, if this is a musical instrument, who is playing it? And it makes us think, this organ looks like something from nature, like a tendril or a tentacle. Um, so is this a sense organ? Is this a musical organ? Is this a structure? What is this and who is playing it? So those are all questions not don't necessarily need to be answered, but they're interesting questions to think about. Um, so hold on to this idea of an organ, um, particularly an organ of perception and what that might be. If we look at a more recent text, Vicki Kirby and her text, her book, Quantum Anthropologies, she talks about this uh, organ, this idea of organ, an organ of perception. And she says, it is a desiring organ that seizes upon its own alienness and in the wonder of the encounter is reconceived. So this description might sound quite um, relevant and familiar to you now after having heard a few other ways of thinking about making strange in the past few weeks, the idea of seizing upon your own alienness and somehow be reconceived. So this is about that shift in perception um, where you seize upon your own alienness. So keep in mind also this word alien because this is related to the concept of strange strange and alien. They're not the same, but they are related. Okay, there's a few things to think about there. So here, um, this is quite small, but I hope you can see um, the, I have used one of the instruments which I, digital instruments, which uh, would be useful maybe for you to play around with if you haven't yet done so. This is from Google, it's the Google Ngram viewer. Um, and so if you, if you just type in Ngram, one word, you get this, um, this device which allows you to type in a word and to set the parameters of how, which years you're interested in the frequency of this word occurring. Um, and then it will show you through the, through the centuries. So I typed in aesthesis, aesthetics, and aesthetic. I started with aesthesis, that's the top one. Then I added aesthetic, and then I added aesthetics because I was interested to see from 1500, 1500 up to the present day, um, or it goes to 2019 anyway, um, how often was this word uh, in a text? And so Google does this search and gives you the stats. So it's really useful um, if you're researching a, a concept and you can see from it also that um, aesthesis uh, is nowhere near as common as aesthetic or aesthetics because this first one, uh, graph on the top there, it does, it does look like a thesis is growing um, 
and the curve is getting steeper as we get towards the 2000s. But then if you look at the, um, the values on the left-hand side, this is much smaller than the values for once the other terms are added. So um, you can see how rare aesthesis is compared to aesthetic and aesthetics. So this is really useful for seeing how um, often a term is used at, at certain points in history and then thinking, why was this used so much at certain points in history? Uh, obviously, there are more texts published than now than there were in uh, the 16th century. So those kinds of things have to be taken into account, but it is a really interesting um, tool to use. Okay, so a bit more on aesthesis and sensory perception. If we go back to Aristotle, and he wrote a lot about uh, sense, sensory perception and um, sense organs, so organs of aesthesis. So this word aesthesis for Aristotle is something between sensation and perception. Um, different philosophers have argued about uh, whether sensation, how different are sensation and perception in Aristotle. The general consensus is they're not the same thing, but they are related. Um, but if we, for, for our purposes, if we focus on the idea of aesthesis as the faculty of sense um, or the sense organ, um, when you learn, when you're a child, you learn the five senses and the organs which are used um, to perceive in these different ways. Um, interestingly, what Aristotle says in the anima um, is that when we perceive something, um, when we take on a perception, it changes our form somehow. That, there's that idea of a shift again. So whether, whether, how that might work and whether we agree with that, um, don't worry too much. Just think about the idea of, of how form is important here. Um, if we have uh, an analogy with the way it works in English, um, anyway, uh, you say, I smelled a smell. I tasted a taste. I saw a sight, etc. So the word for the verb is the same as the word for the noun, the object, which is being sensed. So it's taking on the form somehow. This is a really interesting um, way of thinking about the relation between form and sense perception. Um, so again, without going too deep into that now, it's interesting to think about how for Aristotle, perception is related to change somehow. There is a change happening. He says, perception comes about with an organs being changed and affected for it seems to be a kind of alteration. So there's that idea of the shift even as far back as Aristotle. Okay, that's the, um, the kind of ancient background with Aristotle. Um, just turning now to give us some further um, thoughts on estrangements or alienations and how these are related. Um, I maybe mentioned these uh, in a previous uh, session because we have um, Brecht um, and Verfremdung and um, this is maybe something which a lot of you are already familiar with and um, and then we have Marx and Entfremdung um, so estrangement or alienation and what's interesting and maybe you already have an idea of this yourselves and also it's talked a little bit about in the reading um, of how these things are different to and also 
related to our concept from Shlovsky of defamiliarization. So this is an interesting thing for us to think about in terms of the senses, because um, the way that in Brecht's uh, theatre, for example, the audience is distanced and there is not uh, meant to be a kind of absorption or emotional um, connection. A sensory perception involved in defamiliarization would somehow challenge this. So that's something which we can think about more as the weeks go on. Um, so I'm just flagging these up as other co related concept, concepts which are out there, um, which we can come back to, um, or just it's important that we're aware of. Um, this is in a little bit more detail as well, so that you have the context um, for estrangement or alienation and how they are related to defamiliarization. Um, historically, it has been understood that this idea of alienation or estrangement um, in, in the Christian um, religion, there's a description, uh, Lyotard, theorist, um, French theorist, he writes about this in his book, Libidinal Economy. He says um, that it is through Luther who translated um, um, Jesus was taken outside himself. So if someone is taken outside of themselves, they are somehow estranged from themselves. So this is a, going back to that spatial estrangement. Um, and this has been thought about in, in many different ways. Um, but I just put these very short descriptions here so you have a sense of how that might be understood historically. Um, the idea of being alienated or estranged from yourself. Um, if, if you're religious, this could be a holy state and therefore a desirable and positive state. Um, however, um, in the story of uh, creation and Adam and Eve, um, the fall of man is another type of alienation or estrangement, which could be read negatively. And these are all the religious uh, readings and interpretations. Um, and then this, this, this feeds into the, the political reading from Marx, um, through Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, so we won't, we don't need to go into too much detail about that, but there's a little bit of history for you. Um, and if you're interested, you can re research, go into those um, areas further. Um, so I just wanted to give you that little extra bit of context. Okay. So going back to the Brecht, alienation effect, um, or the Fremdung's effect, or V effect, as it was described um, by Frederick uh, Jameson, theorist Frederick Jameson. Um, as I wrote about, um, Brecht went to China and was inspired by seeing this actor, um, Mei Lan Fang, performing a female role and he also, Brecht also described this um, as the actor going outside of himself or somehow being beside himself. So um, this is another example of making strange in which you are somehow um, outside of your original or former self in order to create or exhibit a shift in perception. Okay, um, so in terms of this idea of alienation as another way of making strange, um, 
I've talked about how it can be perceived as something which we do actively, something which is imposed on us passively, or maybe both, this idea of alienation. So if you feel alienated or if you alienate yourself, these are the different ways we can understand it grammatically as a subjective thing, as an objective thing. Um, and what I'm interested in is how we can think about it as both of those things at the same time, as a subjective and an objective. Uh, we don't need to recognize this subjective objective divide. Um, and a, a really good example of, um, of somewhere where this kind of dissolving of the subject object divide uh, can be seen is in um, the Zeno Feminist Manifesto. Um, so uh, this is a collective called Laboria Cubonics. And um, if you go to Laboria Cubonics Net, you can read the whole manifesto. Um, it's translated into about 12 different languages on there now. Um, so if you prefer to read it in a different language, you can probably find yours there. Um, and I just put this, I, also I have the PDF of the manifesto, I can put this on Tuvel for you if you are interested. Um, and they talk about alienation, it's called a politics for alienation, so they say XF seizes alienation as an impetus to generate new worlds. We are all alienated, but have we ever been otherwise? It is through and not despite our alienated condition that we can free ourselves from the muck of immediacy. So the idea that we are alienated from, uh, we, have, we are in an alienated condition as humans right now in this world, that is somehow derived from Marx. Um, but what these you know, feminists are doing in their manifesto is turning this somehow on its head and seizing alienation. So this is a positive affirmative act. So these give, this gives you some more contexts to work with and some more examples to work with in this making strange domain. To go back to the senses though, um, I've talked about aesthetic and I've talked about aesthesis um, so I thought to finish, um, I would talk about the opposite of that, which is anaesthetic. So um, in this book by Douglas Robinson, in which he talks about estrangement and um, Schlofsky, Tolstoy and Brecht, so he's drawing um, connections and links between these three, um, he says, the basic idea is that conventionalization is psychologically alienating, anesthetizing, and that the reader, therefore, stands in need of some sort of aesthetic shock to break him or her out of the anesthesis. So anesthesis is the absence of perception, we're not perceiving anything if we're in a state of anesthesis. And obviously, anesthetic, the first thing you think of, the first thing I think of when I hear anesthetic is being in the hospital, having an operation and being given anesthetic so you can no longer feel. So anesthetic is the opposite of uh, this shift in perception in order to feel things um, in this defamiliarization process. Uh, this is really interesting. So to connect all of these things up, um, I've drawn a contentious and more uh, contemporary term related to all of these things, which is woke. So without going into huge debates about this word, um, its usage nowadays, um, and 
yeah, political differences. Um, I think it's interesting because it's about uh, perceiving. It's about being awake. Um, so there was a play written, um, uh, a, a play written in the UK called Garvey Lives in the 1970s, which was about um, Marcus Garvey, uh, who was a, um, a black uh, British guy who was reforming um, things in the U in the UK in London, um, and the idea of staying woke. Uh, is a line in that play. And then there are these um, songs from Erica Badu and Childish Gambino, where they also talk about staying woke. But the reason why this is relevant to what we're talking about is because it shows that you are perceiving. You are perceiving, you are sensing, um, and it's a political way of being alert. And this is how it's linked to a shift in perception. So, um, and if you, if so, if when you're under anesthetic, general anesthetic, you're not awake, you can't perceive anything. Um, but when you're awake, you can perceive things. Um, so, I, this is, this is a, um, yeah, a contentious topic and it's something that we can talk about um, because I'm also really interested to know your thoughts on how to connect up. There's more we can talk about in terms of the senses for sure, how we can connect up this idea of perceiving with our senses, um, having political consciousness um, and this idea of anesthetic as being a somehow asleep and not perceiving properly uh, and how we understand this in a metaphoric way. So I look forward to our discussions.